We're going live. Hello, my name is Eva, and I'm going to be your host today for uh, Modern Web. We've got three wonderful speakers that I think are going to be really interesting. Um, and before we start, I'm just going to do a little introduction. So give me a moment, and I will share my screen. So this is Modern Web. Um, hold on two seconds. Somehow it got at the very end. So let's start at the beginning again. Uh, so this is Modern Web. Welcome. Um, our sponsor today is this.labs. They are, we are a JavaScript consultancy um, and I am the operations manager at this dot. And then we have a couple of announcements just before we start. We're starting a couple of new podcasts that are gonna be really interesting and more framework specific. So. Uh, starting in August, we're going to do the first Thursday of the month is going to be Angular Online. The second Thursday of the month is going to be React Online. Um, and then we also have GraphQL Contributor Days coming up. And this JavaScript, the state of frameworks, coming up on August 13th. Um, we also have View Online that we're going to do every month. I believe that's the third Thursday of the month on August 15th. Um, and then we have Web Components coming, Web Components Online coming up too. That'll be on August 22nd. Um, and our speakers today are going to be Aaron Ma, who's a 10-year-old developer and CEO at Firebolt, Stefan Judas, who's a developer evangelist at Twilio, and Marion Scott, who's our own The Stock Apprentice. Um, I'm really excited about their talks. All right. Um, and then, sorry, the schedule. We have our welcome and then each of them giving their, their talks and then our closing notes and goodbye. Um, and that is it for me. I'm going to unshare my screen and then Erin, you can take it away. Okay. Hello everyone. My name is Erin Ma and today I'll be talking about machine learning in the browser. I have a tremendous passion in computer science and I love machine learning and I'm a TensorFlow user. Recently, I graduated from Udacity's self-driving car engineer nano degree program, along with the deep reinforcement learning nano degree. I have also received many certificates from Coursera. Let's get started. Why should you learn machine learning? Well, it's easy to learn. With the vibrant community of machine learning engineers, those community will help you, guide you through your machine learning journey. Plus, there's a lot of free resources so you can learn machine learning in about three months. And also there are three types of machine learning. Supervised learning is number one, which uses label data, which means it takes data from a CSV file that has headers in it. And it's good at predicting an outcome. So it can be good at solving classification, regression, and prediction problems. The second type of machine learning is unsupervised learning. It takes in a CSV file that does not have headers in it. That means it can't predict anything. In some cases, it's even impossible. So that's why it's not good at prediction problems, but it's good at understanding a data file. So it can identify patterns, structures, etc. And the third type of machine learning is reinforcement learning. It's an approach to artificial intelligence that uses reward-based learning to maximize its own rewards. A recap of reinforcement learning is that's an area of ML and it enables an agent to learn in an interactive environment by trial and error using feedback from its own actions and experiences. It's a model that makes a sequence of decisions that finds the best possible behavior to maximize its own reward. Here are some words that every single reinforcement learning engineer uses. Agent is a robot or a player that's going to play in a simulated or real environment. The environment is the place where the robot or the player is going to play in. The reward tells if the robot or the player is doing well or not. The action is a set of possible moves that the agent can take. The state is a situation in which the agent finds itself in. The policy is a strategy in which the agent employs to determine the next possible action. Let's take a look at that. For example, if we have a dog as the agent in this particular environment, and our owner tells our dog to sit, the dog wants a reward of a bone 
So he thinks of a random action. For example, sit. And he does it. But the weight's going to be very scary because the dog does not know if he's done good or not. But once he gets a reward, then he knows that he's done good. And he'll keep maximizing and improving his good behavior. But there's a problem to it. The location of reward is always different. Because once you solve this problem, the next problem is the reward is, like, for example, here, which is different from here. So if we give our dog, for example, we say, speak, let it bark, the dog would just keep sitting because he doesn't know where the next location of the reward is. And the policy is always changing. And the transition between states is uncertain because in the dog problem, the dog was scared in the transition. So to solve this problem, your agent has to train on the policy for a very long time. But to, in order to do that, you must interact with the agent appropriately, which means the agent sends an action to the environment, then the environment sends back the current state and the reward back to the agent. The agent keeps doing this until it has reached its reward. And the algorithm for this is the probability of transition from state S to the next state under the action of A is this algorithm. The next algorithm, number two, is the immediate reward after transition from this state to the next state with the action of A. Let's take a look at the discount factor, which takes points away. So the discount factor takes points away because you don't want your reward to be infinity. Because once it reaches infinity, it can't give out any more reward, and then your agent will do very badly. So the discount factor takes a bunch of points away to prevent the reward from getting to one that one in infinity. And let's take a look at the discount factor algorithm. So here's what a discount factor algorithm will look like: our agent, and it'll take one point away for every step that the agent takes, and twelve points away if it lands on a fire and plus 10 points if it gets to a diamond. So the robot will, will be encouraged and motivated to take the less few steps possible to get to the diamond while avoiding the obstacles, which is a fire. And that works by training on the policy. Let's see, look, look at that in a self driving car situation. So this is our policy. So if our policy gets a parameter of zero, then we're going to know to apply the brake, that that's what's shown on our policy. And if our policy gets zero, then we'll have to apply the brake, as shown in this policy here. And why should you learn reinforcement learning? Well, it's fun. Let's get also to solve real world problems of early recognition, which is exactly what every person wants. So the problem solved with reinforcement learning are endless possibilities, such as AlphaGo Zero. It was created by Google's DeepMind team, and it beat the top player in the ancient Chinese game of Go. OpenAI 5, the robots, beat the top professionals in the game of Dota 2 and many other games. Reinforcement learning has also learned to walk, drive the car, did financial analysis, and made rec recommendation systems such as YouTube, and much more. And you may know, not, not know it, but you may be part of the 13% of the people around the world that use reinforcement learning every single day. Now let's take a look at the difference between the traditional software development and machine learning. In the traditional software development, the input and the algorithm is known, and we write a function that produces an output. In machine learning, we take in pairs of input and output data, which we will train a model to try and figure out the algorithm. And it, let's take a look at that in a real world scenario, such as the Celsius to Fahrenheit problem. You can see here that the input is already known, and our algorithm, which is Celsius times 1.8 plus 32, is known. And then we try to figure out the output. But in machine learning here, you can see we have our inputs and our outputs. So we enter 15, we get the output of 59. But our model knows that. So our model will do hidden layers, which is training our model and it's going to figure out the algorithm. And if you want more machine learning basis, go to this YouTube link to see my previous talk on machine learning basics. Now let's get to our real world scenario of a self-driving car. 
So what makes a self-driving car? It's a car that drives autonomously without a human on board. It also has hardware, radar, LiDAR, camera, etc. The software, such as the Apollo car software by Baidu, Tesla Autopilot, NVIDIA Drive, or etc. And it works together to safely bring passengers from this destination to a specified destination. It's a car that combines sensors and hardware to control, navigate, propel, and drive the car. It's also a car that has a computer in it. Obviously, or else it won't be a self-driving car. And this must the the car's computer must work together, which we have three units with four modules. The three units are sensing, perception, and decision. In their sensing unit, which has the GPS sensor, the LiDAR sensor, and the camera, it will take in data from the simulation. In the perception unit, which has localization, object recognition, and object tracking, it takes in data from the high dimensional generated map module. Decision, which is the path planning, action prediction, and obstacle avoidance, will take in data from the model training, because the model training will tell where our car should go. In our operating system, has a software on our data storage module. And the hardware platform will unify all of these sensors and hardware together. I'm going to talk about each of these in detail later on. So the hardware is connected, is put and connected all around the car. The radar is all around the car. LiDAR also around the car. Side cameras, front cameras. So here, the LiDAR is put on the top of the car. Inside the trunk, we have an industrial PC and also a GPS receiver. And it's wired together by taking in power from the car power system. And it's going to go through the data speed 12 volt power panel, which will split the power into five seconds. One section will go to the LTE router, which will connect it to the computer with the uh, NVIDIA GPU for the Ethernet. And another section will go to the computer to power up the computer. One section will go to the GPS receiver, which is also going to be connected to the computer. And one section will be connected to the GPS, which is connected to the GPS receiver, which gets connected to the computer. And the last and final section is going to be split into half, or one half to the LiDAR, one half into the radar. And all of these components in hardware, along the can car, and the chassis, and the accessories will be connected to the computer. In the sensor fusion, let's talk about sensor fusion. So sensor fusion has three sensors, camera, LiDAR, and radar. So what's a camera? It's an optical instrument placed all around the car and for simulation purposes. You might have seen this LiDAR before, like on Waymo. And so this camera is actually very important. So the LiDAR creates a simulated map and then the camera will add color to it. So then the car will know if the traffic light is red, yellow, or, or green. And what's a LiDAR? It's a light detection and ranging system. It's a remote sensing method using light in the form of a pulse sensor to measure ranges to the earth. It was originally developed for military use, but then self-driving car engineers saw that, hey, I can put on my self-driving car, and it works perfectly. So that's what they did. And that's why we have LiDAR on self-driving cars now. And here's a sample simulation from a LiDAR. Here you can see what we have our point cloud, with this blue arrow here, this red line. And this is just a simulation without the camera adding color. But once the camera adds color to it, then you can see a colorful image. In a radar, it's a detection system using radio waves. So it sends out radio waves and then it waits for the response to count back. Counting on the number of seconds, or milliseconds, or minutes, then it will know how far an object, how far an object is from. That's why it can detect anything around it. <clears throat> and the perception is very important. It's the ability for a separate car to see, hear, and become aware of something using sensors. And the localization is required. It's the implementation of algorithms to estimate where a vehicle is with an error of less than 10 centimeters. It's required because in a self-driving car, you can't make any mistakes. You can't afford to do that. But GPS is not very accurate. It's, it has an error of less than 300 feet. Using GPS, we might even collide with a car. 
That's why we need localization to make sure that we don't collide with the car. And that's why we have an error of less than 10 centimeters. And the PID control is a control and feedback mechanism used in the industrial control system. And it requires continuously modulated control. This PID controller is required so then it knows whether it should turn left, right, or keep going forward. And the Kelvin filter. It's known in statistics and control theory that Kelvin filtering, known as linear quadricate estimation, or LQE, is an algorithm that uses a series of measurements observed over a huge amount of time. Extended comb filter is a linearization about an estimate of the current mean covariance. And my favorite common filter is, drum roll please, unscented common filter. It uses a deterministic sampling technique known as the unscented transformation, transformation to pick a minimal set of sample points. This is my favorite common filter because it's much more accurate than the extended common filter. All it needs is the ground transposition, the un unscented common filter position estimation, and the position measurements. The lower it is, the better. So there was two college students developed this because they thought that the extended comb filter stinks because of so much error, and I stink too. So that's why I chose the unscented comb filter. And all the images and content you just saw was from my own self-driving car project, which you can go here to see it. And also, AWS, which is Amazon, had made their own self-driving car, which is called AWS Deep Racer. So this AWS Deep Racer has a camera on it, which will pass in the data to your reward function. So your reward function uses reinforcement learning to give it reward that stays in the lane and takes points away if it does bad. You can see here, it's good, it's bad now, it's on the side, bad. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So it's always constantly changing. Now it's good, then it's bad. So it's just constantly changing the reward. Let's talk about Metacar, which we'll be using to build our final project. It's a browser-based reinforcement learning environment for self-driving cars simulation. And Metacar is built on top of TensorFlow.js, which means it has endless possibilities. So it includes sensors and hardware in a simulated environment, and you get to practice reinforcement learning skills in a fun, creative way. Now let me show you my project here. Okay, so here you can see that we have our simulated environment here. And then here is our current state in LiDAR points. We're using the Q learning algorithm, which means it takes in the action and the state. We also have the acceleration so that we know which, how fast we're going. And the steering angle, will be telling us how if it's turning left or right. The reward is going to go high if it does good and go down if it does bad. And here is the reward and the accurate loss and the critical loss and episode duration noise distance. So this is the data for when you're training your model. It's going to be populated once you click one of these two buttons. So I've already pre-trained it. It takes about two minutes to finish training. I'm just going to load my train agent and click play. It's doing good. You can see the reward goes up. It's doing good, good, bad. You can see that it's always changing. You can see it's always changing here. So I'll be publishing this code on GitHub, which you can find here on my GitHub profile. Get up profile right here. And here are some next steps that I recommend you to go to. So this is the official Medicare project. You can also create your own level. So not just the hardest level, but you can create your own simulated environment. And here's some more Medicare demos for the Tensile Genius documentation. You go here. What I recommend you to do is you program your own reinforcement learning agent. So you can see my code on get up and then you can Use that as an inspiration, build your own RL agent. And you can also go to a self-driving car and deep reinforcement learning nano degree program at Udacity. 
in incorporating general intelligence, bodily intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, political intelligence, and social intelligence in your AI systems are part of the future ML research by Amit Ray in his book, Compassion AI, which is stating that incorporating intelligence in your AI systems are going to be in the future ML research. Which, which he is encouraging people to learn machine learning and incorporate intelligence into AI system. So I hope in this tutorial, in this talk, that you learn about the reinforcement learning problem, which was the rewards always changing, policies always changing, and the solution, which was you train on the policy for a very long time. Now some RL techie words such as. Agent, reward, state, action, etc. And also, I hope that you built a reinforcement learning foundation in stuff such as a policy, etc. And also, my reinforcement learning stuff during car demo project, which I talked about, and then also in self driving cars, I hope you learn all of the components on a self driving car and how self driving cars hardware is wired together. And about the Amazon's AWS Deep Bracer Reinforcement Learning Car, which you can pre-order today. And also Medicar, which was the package that we used to build our project. And also my own self-training car project. So thank you for listening and have a great day. Don't forget to don't forget to follow me on Twitter at, at Aaron H. Ma. Thank you. Thank Any you. Questions? Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, so very much. All right, Savan, it's your turn. Would you like to take it away? All right. Thank you, Aaron. That was lovely. Thank you. All right. So you see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. So after some fancy stuff, let's talk about HTTP. <laughs> HTTP headers for the responsible developers. And before I kick the whole thing off, I want to tell you about my journey on the web. So basically, I'm now 33 years old, and I am using the internet for quite a little bit. And when I started entering the web at the age of 12 or 13 or 14, um, this is basically what I played around with. Google was not a thing yet, at least not a real thing yet. And what we see here is, for example, a platform, the first social media platform that was available in Germany. And so I found myself chatting with random people um, in 1999. And this is where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the middle of Germany. And I started chatting with people in Berlin because we shared a little bit of, we shared a common interest like music and where I'm coming from, these there were no people that liked the music that I liked. And that was for the first time, 1999, when I figured out that the web connects people. So and then um, I progressed and I did something with music as a first career, but eventually in 2010, I became a web developer. And then basically the story of the web connect people changed a little bit because now I entered the other side of the table and it changed to that we connect people, right? We are building for the web and we have the possibilities to connect people by building stuff good for good stuff for the web. We enabled people. Sometimes we may build products that really help people out to solve the need. And yeah, we help people. And let me introduce myself. I'm Stefan. Uh, I work for Twilio. In case you don't know Twilio, we are a communications API. Uh, which allows you to do uh, SMS, phone calls, video, and all these kind of things via an API. And the most important thing right now in the next 20 minutes is that I want to be a responsible developer. Because when we are looking back where I started my journey on the web, 1999, this was where I was, right? Central Europe, um, and I was just caring about my little bubble. But when we now look at 20 years later, um, 2019, where are actually the most internet users coming from? They're coming from China, they're coming from India, and they're coming from the United States. And this is, of course, only internet statistics. But I, for example, also block a little bit on my private website. And when I look at my personal statistics, I see that there th just last month, 300 people from Brazil read my articles, which is very excited. exciting. 100 people from Vietnam uh, were there, or even 80 people from South Africa. I'm honestly very excited about that. But at the end, it really doesn't matter because when we're building for the web, we should be building for everybody. And when we build stuff for the web, we should stop saying this kind of sentence. We don't have users in a certain conditions. We don't have users um, that use uh, in that region, or we don't have users that X. Because when you say this, basically, what you're creating is a chicken and egg problem. Because when you're not building for the web, 
uh, websites or products that work for a certain amount or for a particular set of people, then these people simply will not use your website or your product. And this brings me to the challenge of building a good website. When you want to build for the web today, there is so much stuff to consider, right? You have to figure out a, a good design. Um, there are certain areas in the world where, for example, red and green, the meaning of them is inverted. Do you consider that when you're building for the web, when you go globally? You have to figure out a content strategy. Um, you have to build fast stuff because not everybody is sitting on a Wi-Fi network. And maybe some person on a sloppy 3G connection, uh, maybe we need your product or your website the most. It has to be accessible for people with, for example, assistive technology or have has to have a proper contrast ratio. What technology do you use? That's the hardest one. Sometimes I bike shed ages to figure out just, hey, do I go with React, React View, or what should I do? And uh, you have to optimize for the network stack, and you have to make it work on proper on all the devices out there. And there's, there's way, way more. But right now, I want to um, continue with the network stack. So let's talk about HTTP. So basically, when visitors visit a website, what they do is they make an HTTP request. And this includes a set of key value pairs, which are called headers. And then the server responds um, with the actual uh, requested resources and also with response headers. So and to um, familiarize you with what you can do with HTTP headers, I built a little website. So what you see here is the responsible .dev. I had to build a, buy a .dev domain. But you see that that JavaScript is currently disabled. So when you now refresh the site, you will see that there's a lot of stuff going on which you may not need. So there's a third party script not behaving. It's asking for permission. But also, when you go to CodePen, for example, you can easily frame this website and you can pretend to be my responsible dev website. So, what I want to want to do is I want to fix this website without changing any source code by only setting some HTTP headers uh, on this site. And I think this is very much needed because the web is a scary place. When you're following the, the internet news a little bit, you will find out that these um, stories like people are doing uh, crypto mining in people's browsers. This has happened constantly these days. Uh, and when we're building for the web, we're always relying on others. Either we use source code that is hosted on GitHub, or we just use simple or normal third-party text like for analytics purposes or anything um, similar. And I 100% believe that the web has to be safe. For example, it shouldn't be possible that my mother accidentally mines cryptocurrency without knowing. And the foundation for a safe internet is HTTPS. So HTTPS, first of all, prevents evil hoodie hackers to interfere your connections. But it also allows you, because it's sending um, all the data over an encrypted connection, but it also allows you to use HTTP2, which is a new protocol, and cutting edge front end features like service work and get user media. But when you look around, though, you will find, for example, there's this nice site, which is called Why No HTTPS. And we'll find out that not everybody is on HTTPS yet. And what is surprising for me, I'm coming from Germany, Central Europe, and the ARD is a massive German media outlet. And they're not serving HTTPS, which means that when I'm sitting in an internet cafe and I'm browsing there, it could be that someone is messing around with this, which makes me actually very, very sad. And I don't know why they are not going HTTPS. When you run on a secure connection, what you can do to go the extra mile is you can ensure um, encryption. So what you can do is you can also set a strict transport security header, which tells the browser, hey, please remember that this height is only served over HTTPS, which is pretty cool. You can define max age, which is in seconds. You can define if, it should, if this setting, setting should include subdomains, and if you want to preload for other things. So what does that preload thing do? Actually, when you set this configuration for strict transport security, what you can do is you can go to this site, htspreload.org, and you can submit your um, domain to a global list of sites that only work on HTTPS. Did you ever wonder why you cannot use, for example, local.dev um, with HTTP anymore? The reason is that what you see there. So all browsers um, have an internal list that defines what protocols are possible for which URLs. And when you submit your site to this website, you may end up eventually in there. And um, this is the Chromium source code, but it is also used by Firefox and other browsers. But HSTS is not only about security. What it also brings up um, is a little speed improvement. So for example, when you type a URL in the address bar of your browser, what happens is that usually the first request is over HTTP. When you're now on a slow connection, all that happens is that the server responds like, nope, you want to do HTTPS, which you can save when the browser already knows, nope, this site only works over HTTPS. 
And when you're running on all HTTPS, what you have to do is you have to upgrade all the HTTP requests that are in there, right? Because browsers may block um, requests to unsecured domains eventually. What you can do is you can also set another header, which is the content security policy header for upgrade insecure requests. That can be very handy when you're ma maintaining a massive site and there are just some images or some um, other things hanging in there, which you don't know where they're coming from and you cannot change that. With this header, you can automatically uh, update all the requests to use HTTPS. And now we're talking about content security policy already, which is actually useful for limitation of what is allowed in a site. It allows a lot of configuration options. So you see a bunch of here. So you can define where should images be allowed um, to load from, um, where are fonts um, allowed, and there's a little bit of cutting edge stuff in there. And you can define these configuration either via a meta element in your head, and you can say, hey, I only want to load these assets, or you set a proper um, header like I prefer. CSP by itself is not an easy thing to do, though. So for example, what you see here is the content security policy for my own website. And this is tough. Coming up with something like this and finding all the URLs that make it to build a good or build your own website is actually very tricky. So what you can do is to start get, get, to get um, started with CSP is that you usually want to run in a report only mode. So what happens now is that you can deploy this and you can serve this header and then you can define a report URI and you can slowly get a notice um, when something would be blocked and you can slowly adjust and tweak these settings, which is actually very, very nice. So when you know CSP a little bit, you might find out like hey, that I have not good stuff in there. So right now I have an unsafe inline and unsafe evil flag, which allows JavaScript to be inline executed, which could be a huge um, attack vector. Uh, but I'm using a framework, and I'm currently evaluating how to get rid of this. So when you have to use inline JavaScript, which is always a tricky thing, what you can do is you can define a, a SHA hash in your header itself, which then whitelists certain inline scripts. This is a little bit brittle, though, because sometimes when you change the JavaScript, you may need then to update the headers, uh, which, depending on your infrastructure, might be a tricky thing to do. So what you can also do is you can give it a nonce ID, which is actually pretty nice. And then you can say, hey, this script block is actually whitelisted, and that's a good thing. So how's the support for CSP today? We're pretty green for the first level of content security policy. Some cutting edge stuff is not completely in uh, supported yet. So if you uh, check out the cutting edge, you have to have a look at that first. So I am a big fan of CSP. And I ask myself, how many pages are actually using CSP? And I went over to HTTP Archive, which is a site that only scroll, uh, crawls the internet. And I had a look at 2,800,000 pages, and only 6% of these pages use CSP, which makes me very sad, because this means that we, uh, that attackers and hackers can easily mine cryptocurrency and do malicious stuff in all the other side, because we wouldn't even notice that something's happened. I think that we can do better. So when you start using CSP, is what you should do is you should deploy first uh, with a report mode, and then only when you have a look at your logs and you see that all your stuff is actually whitelisted in CSP and it won't be blocked, um, then you should turn it on. So by just setting headers, I um, set up a different um, subpath of the site. So what you see there is a responsible dot dev safe, and you see there that this malicious script that was in there is now blocked, and also that when I want to iframe it, that this is not possible. This makes already the this side a little bit safer because the web is crucial for people and i notice that basically every day because i'm traveling um uh, on a regular basis and for example this just recently happened and i was in the ukraine uh, in europe and i got out of my airplane and i got this message which is in german but let me translate that uh, my mobile provider sent me this nice message telling me hey you can buy six megabytes of data for two euros uh, which is, I don't know, $3 or something, but you have to use it in 24 hours, which is ridiculous because there are websites that are six megabytes already out there. So the web has to be affordable. And one part of making an affordable web is don't request the same content over and over again. So what you have to do is um, you have to give proper caching instructions. So what you see there is a cache control header, which you can define in seconds, how long a resource should actually be cached, um, but this doesn't necessarily mean that the browser doesn't make the request anymore. Because browsers re-invalidate re and check, hey, is it still the resource uh, on a constant basis? So what you can do is you can use the immutable directive of cache control, which then really tells the browser, hey, please don't request this again, because it's maybe a, 
a hashed file like main uh, one two three four five dot uh, CSS or something. These files doesn't need to be uh, refetched again. So what's the support for immutable? Um, we're not quite there yet, and it's in this set for quite a little bit. But for supporting browsers, you can um, get a nice little boost here. And especially for render blocking resources like CSS, this can be a nice thing. Caching by itself is very, very hard, though. And I'm not going much into details of uh, caching. So if you want to have a proper look into the cache control header, uh, I recommend this article by Harry Roberts. But it's not only about saving requests. It's also about sending the right data in the first place. And guess what? The browser, when it requests the resources, it tells us also what kind of um, formats and encodings it understands. What you see there is the accept encoding header, which is sent by the browser when it um, asks the server, server for a resource. And you see there a gzip, um, deflate, and br. Br is something that is heavily underused today. And I think that's very, very uh, sad. So BR stands for boldly. And when you see here is a CSS file that I just took. It was 100K initially. Then I compressed it with gzip, which made 15K. And then I compressed it with boldly, which made 10K, which is great, because this is just data that we can save on the wire. But I already hear you saying, hey, friends. Uh, no, I already hear you saying, Stefan, boldly compression is so slow, which is a common misconception. And it's basically comparing apples with oranges. So when we have these two compression algorithms, gzip and broadly, it's basically um, two different things. gzip runs in, uh, has nine modes, and broadly by itself has 11 modes. And when you just enable these features, um, gzip runs in mode six, and broadly runs in mode 11. The level six of gzip is made for good compression speed and good outcomes and small compressor in size, whereas level 11 by broadly is only set to give them the smallest files possible. So, which means that Broadly by itself is on mode 11, very, very slow, but has good file savings. But when we now even tweak Broadly and to use, for example, level four, it tends to compress better than gzip with a comparable speed, which means we can save some bytes on the, on the wire, which is really, really nice. But the thing with gzip is that usually when a server, uh, when a browser hits the server is that it compresses on the fly. But maybe you can even, um, pre-generate all the broadly files and get all the file savings up front without making on, on the fly. I mean, we all have built processes, processes in the front end in place. So maybe this could be a step of your build process anyway. If you want to learn more about broadly and the uh, compression algorithms, um, the folks at Akamai did a very extensive research on what the savings could be on this side. So I highly, check, uh, highly recommend to check that out. So what's the support of this compression algorithm right now? Well, we're pretty green here. You can use that today, and I think that's very, very nice. So we talked about um, avoiding requests, about um, serving the right encoding. But the hardest part or the biggest part of traffic that goes over the internet is media, right? And I'm a front-end developer, and I'm guilty of writing this kind of picture elements myself. So what you see there is a picture element that checks for WebP support, but also ships responsive images so that we always save and um, serve the smallest images possible. But guess what? When the browser uh, asks for an image, it also sends the accept header. And the accept header tells us what formats are supported. So when we look at uh, WebP, um, we are pretty green. Safari is not joining the party, but I think the peer pressure is pretty high these days. Um, you can just work on the server side and uh, work with this header and adjust what you serve to the users. And then there's also the accept ch header, which stands for client hints, which is a header that you can set on the server side, which then basically tells the browser, hey, please give me additional information about, in this case, width and viewport width for a lifetime of 100 seconds which then means when the browser requests an image, it will tell us the width of the image and the viewport width. Now you can um, have one uh, image without source set uh, uh, definitions, and you have to give it some viewport and uh, some layout information it uses the sizes attribute. But this will then lead to requests that includes all the critical information to serving the right image. You see there that it gives us the pixel dimensions. And it also takes pixel density into consideration, which is really, really cool. You can then go to the server side or even go into the service breaker and serve tailored media. If you want to learn more about this CH header, uh, this talk by Jeremy Wagner is very, very nice. So when we go to the responsible.dev slash affordable, you will see that, first of all, I'm serving broadly compression, which saves a little bit data on the wire. 
But also when you have a look at the, uh, the initial HTML response, you see that I'm setting the accept ch header, which then leads to the fact for the header JPEG that it gives me all the information about the image. So you see it there. And even though the uh, browser request header JPEG, I'm serving reg p because I'm working with the accept header. So with this, you see that I ha don't have complex HTML in my source files. And I am able to ship perfect matching media, which is very nice. So this is very important to save some money and data because the web is with us very day. And unfortunately, we reached this state today. And this is a website that my friend or a former colleague did last year. And I think that <laughs> looking at this video is just very, very sad. I think the web shouldn't be only safe and affordable, it should also be respectful because nobody wants to deal with this. And the most important thing when talking about respect is probably um, taking time into consideration. Because when you waste your user's time, you're not very respectful. What you can do is you can use preload directives, which you can use as a meter element or even then a header to speed up how certain things are loaded. So for example, you see here the link uh, for an image. Uh, and I'm telling with the initial request the browser, hey, Please load that up front. You will need that later. And I can speed up the navigation with this. Be careful with this, though. You have to use a no push directive, because otherwise, certain infrastructures will use HT push, which is not proper caching, um, caching taking into consideration. So this is a header that is great to speed up critical resources. How's the support for that? Um, Firefox is not there yet, but we are slowly getting there. And then what we don't want to do is we want to annoy all our users. And that is actually funny, because two and a half years when AMP, this uh, Google framework, was released, um, all the, working, uh, the people working on standards were like, this is not good. We have to um, come up with a standard spec solution to kind of limit what is possible in a website. And what you see there is feature policy, which you can use to actually define what is possible in your website. And remember on the responsible dev that there was a location dialogue, um, permission dialogue. With this, you can define really what should be possible. And you can bring in third-party scripts and disallow, for example, to ask for a location or microphone access. Unfortunately, we're now entering cutting edge here. So that is a little bit still uh, under consideration. But there are also two cool one ones in there. For example, you see uh, unoptimized images and unsized media. With this, you can limit yourself to not ship not resized media, which I think is a very cool thing. You can also define when you have third-party iframes what should be possible in these iframes. And you will have access to this API using um, document feature policy, uh, which is really cool, because this, this way you can figure out what should be possible. Be careful, though. The JS API, API changed recently. So th using this is really um, be careful when you use this. So you may ask yourself, what happened to the most annoying one, which is push notifications? Um, people working on this figured out that um, limiting push notifications is actually harder um, than first thought. So um, if you want to check the state of this, you can check out this GitHub issue. So what's the support of uh, feature policy? We are very much cutting edge here, um, but we're, we're slowly getting there. And I'm actually very excited about this. So when we go look at the website and we go to the responsible.dev respectful, you see that the permission dialogue is gone. And when we check the water, uh, network waterfall, you see that the modern web PNG is actually loaded as a second term, even though it was only requested in the styles thanks to the preload header. So you usually want to use that for fonts and critical uh, resources. So after all this, I think that building for the web is still very, very hard. And it's very hard to keep track with all these new uh, technologies. We have to take, talk, think about design, content, performance, accessibility, frameworks, network devices. And there's so, so much more um, to building a good website. Speaking about headers, if you want to get a more complete overview about all things possible, because I only picked my favorite ones, you can have a look at this um, slides by my friend Chep. HTTP headers for the, the hidden champions is the almost complete slide deck. Or you check out Andrew Betts' uh, talk, uh, Headers for Hackers, which is a really, really cool thing. So when we're building for the web, I really think that the web has to be safe. Because I can only repeat myself, it shouldn't be possible that my mother accidentally um, mines cryptocurrency without knowing. I think that the web should be affordable because there are people worldwide using our stuff. And not everybody is using the latest and greatest phone on a stable connection. And I think that the web should be respectful. So the web has to be safe, affordable, and respectful. So that really is for everybody.
And thank you very much, I'm Stefan. And yeah, that was my turn. Thank you so much, Stefan. I really enjoyed your chat. Okay, Marianne, I think it's your turn next. Can you all hear me? Yep, we can okay. hear you. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Marion Scott. I am a disc stock apprentice, which I'm um, actually just ended the program, well, close to ending the program once I. Um, commit my second PR. Um, today I'll be talking about Apple Tools. It's adding visual testing using Apple Tools, which is um, to your software um, applications. So I'm a native of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm the first graduate of Black Women in STEAM Apprentice Program, and I'm also a Distot Finfire Apprentice. Um, I graduated from Wazoo's um, Software Engineering Bootcamp which the co-founder of um, Apple is the CEO and founder. Um, I have a BS degree in e-business and an AA degree in education. Yes, I can teach, but I prefer not to. <laughs> um, in spring 2020, I would start my MS in software engineering. I haven't decided where yet, but spring 2020 will be the goal. Um, today, I was talking a little bit about the apprentice program with this thought. Um, it's a hire of Finpire, which Tracy is so advocate about this program. Um, it provides solution, diversity, and deliver um, inclusion and diversity with um, females who's looking to get um, involved or build their skills in software testing. And using Apple Tools, you get a great mentorship program. My mentor, James, was like phenomenal. <laughs> and I miss him because last week was his last week. <laughs> um, and he, and he, I mean, he taught me a lot of how to organize the code, insert the test strips in the application. It was amazing. Um, and I learned a lot. And it actually built my confidence through this program to actually get out there. Hey, I'm valuable. I'm company and I'm the person that you need on your team to test your software. And if you want to know more about it and get involved in it or come, I have the website listed below. So you can contact, use the website, submit your resume and Tracy or a team member or Eva will get back to you um, regarding prospect opportunities. So next is i'm gonna talk about adding the visual testing my first pr was regarding was within like angler which is nga ngrx and apple tools using i cypress sdk the great thing about apple tools that it has they do have tutorials to um that guide you through testing the test strips um and app in, in, within the applications so my first one was using Cypress and it was an Angular application. But the thing is the you have I had to take it a step further because it was in actually TypeScript. And Apple Tools right now is not set up to have a to test TypeScript. So I had to use advanced configurations. But the tutorials, the thing the cool thing about the tutorials with Apple Tools, they take you step by step, one, two, three. And it's amazing. So next is using the Apple Tools API key, which once you go through the terminal, insert the test um, strip codes, um, you have this key that you have to insert inside the terminal to actually to run the test. So once you do all the NPM installations and things like that. So this is my first PR. You see that I did it did pass. Um, I had I ran it several times just to make sure. So and on your right hand side, you see me actually like grabbing the key. So in your Apple Tools account, you have a little guy like on the left hand side of the page at the top and you click on my API key and which it will give you the key once you have to uh, copy to your clipboard 
then go back into your terminal and export it, export it into the terminal to actually run the um the test. That's the cool thing about <laughs> Alpha Tools. It's it's so easy, smooth, and everything. So so here, here is the configuration that I, I thought I could use, but it didn't happen. <laughs> so um, the configuration used in this app of Cypress was um, the original initial one is CI is CY dot eyes open. You see that I have an error right now at this at this time. But when I had to, I was like, OK, this is not working. And this was where James and I actually had to come like, hey, we need a advanced configuration because this is really not in Angular is really in TypeScript. So we use the advanced configuration CY as any. So um, that eyes open and you see I don't have any errors. The test ran smooth and it passed And next. So once it runs smooth, pass and everything can go into your, once. This is why you need to keep because. The cool, the other cool, the next cool thing about Apple Tools is that you they take snapshots of why the test is running. So and they enter, they insert the snapshots, the snapshots into the your account. So everybody will probably have a will have a different key. So whatever code or test you're running, it will go into the snapshots will go and enter into your account. And it will show that it's passed. And, and it, the, what you wrote in snapshots or the pictures of what part or section you was testing within your code. And this, that is so cool about that. I really love it. And it just, Alan Tools just makes software testing so simple. Studying manually, visual test automation is the best to me. <laughs> to me, but I hope it will be the, like the greatest to everyone else. Um, so now I have went like now uh, Apple Tool is automatically run visual tests and scales across every app, browser, OS, and screen size. So you can do it on a desktop, laptop. You can run it on an iPad, any browser, Windows. Um, because the tutorials, um, the thing about Apple Tools, another cool thing that they have, they you can test any language from Java, JavaScript, um, PHP. Uh, React and of course Angular and TypeScript, so it's so cool. And you can also um, they have tests that you can run through using C plus plus or C sharp. So and it capture visual differences via full page screenshots and compare visual differences across every platform. Um, third thing, it run visual tests automatically with every release with every release. So. If you have a job application that you want to run in Cypress or Storybook, which is my second PR is, is, is in Storybook, which is a React application, which I'm getting ready to commit now to GitHub for it can get merged into the um, open source um, project. So um, so it's really it's a really cool tool that you can use for software testing. Um, it's smooth. It takes seconds if you understand the code, read through the code and the tutorials like I re, re, uh, reiterate on the tutorials, the tutorials that go through step by step. And if you sometimes you would have to use a advanced configuration and so because some other because the actual initial configurations probably wouldn't run and it's amazing. So and thank and to the help of James and actually meeting Brandon Roberts <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago at Refactor because it was his uh, open source project and it was um, it's NGRX and it was really great. So that's Apple Tools for you. <laughs> um, and I like to say thank you to this dot Tracy and James and to NGRX Brandon Roberts. And women who code Alansa, because if it wasn't for them, I would have met Tracy and Brandon. So within the software program and get into software and trying to find your place as a non-traditional um, career changer, networking is amazing. Networking works. So through from, a, from women who code, I met Tracy. Through Tracy, I met James and Brandon. So and it builds it built. It's building my career as a software engineer 
And networking, like I can't emphasize this no more, networking is like the really best thing, right? <laughs> to, to get your career ongoing and moving forward. So in this field as a career changer. So if you have any questions, you can ask me now. <laughs> Thank you, Marion. I really appreciate it. I don't have any questions from the chat for you, but we really appreciate your chat and all of your work. Um, you. I think that that is the end of this episode of Modern Web. I really appreciate all three of you coming on and sharing. Um, it makes it super interesting. So thank you very much. And I think we'll end. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.